Good evening, everyone. This is Dr. Nesli Ancevic coming to you from Turkey on a special English edition on Israel and Palestine dynamics. Joining me today is a very prominent name, Dr. Bishara Bahba. Dr. Bishara is not just an analyst. He's been at the forefront of issues historically and today. In fact, he was an advisor to the late Yasser Arafat. He served as the vice president of U.S. Palestinian Council. He membered various delegations on arms control and regional security. He is a graduate of Harvard, but also taught at Harvard Kennedy School as well as Al Quds, Hebron, and Bethlehem Universities. He has written extensively on Israel and Palestine, particularly on arms sales. And in, that, in addition to all of that, he is from the Wall Street. Um, Bishara, welcome to Turkey and welcome to our deep dive. Thank you very much. I'm very pleased to be in Turkey. I feel like I'm being at home. Great. Thank you so much. So given the background, which I only introduced bits and pieces of it, um, you can help us understand many aspects of this issue. But I do want to start with something that I find very important, and that's your identity. You're an Arab. You were born in Jerusalem. You're a Palestinian, but you're a Christian. Now, why that is important is that since October 7, we've been talking about two groups of people. We've been talking about Israeli citizens, the Jews murdered by Hamas, and we've been talking about Palestinian Muslims murdered, starved, massacred by IDF and the Israeli government. But we know that there is um, a Christian presence in Gaza and Palestine, even though certain accounts after the church were bombed denied that a Christian presence. Um, but in fact, your first, uh, your relatives are in uh, Gaza and Palestine. So can you please tell us a little bit about that? Why don't we hear as much uh, about the Christian voices? Because they are uh, subject to the same air prison, the same humiliation, the same apartheid state. And maybe as a follow up to that, what's the relationship between um, Western Christian Zionism and Christian Arabs? Is there unease? What's going on there? Um, first of all, I mean, the Christian presence in Palestine has been there since the since the time of Christ. We're not we're not comers to Palestine. We we emanated from Christ. So uh, we've been there for thousands of years, two thousand at least, uh, two thousand, you know, and. Um, Unfortunately, our numbers have dwindled. Right. Uh, over the past, during the Ottoman times, uh, Christian presence in Palestine was quite dominant. I mean, and um, uh, in Jerusalem itself, Al Quds, twenty-five percent of the population of the population was Christian. All right. Now. The totality of Christian presence in the Palestinian territories, meaning the West Bank, Gaza, East Jerusalem, is less than 1% of the population of Palestine, of those territories. Right. Uh, and uh, that was partly because, uh, I mean, I, I can... I can give ideas as to why Christians have left or were forced out. In my case, I was forced out. The Israel, I was born and raised in Al Quds, in the old city of Jerusalem. And um, uh, after a certain number of years in the United States studying and so on, the Israelis informed me that my residency which was issued by the Israeli in Jerusalem was revoked. Mm. The only way I can go back is using the US passport as an American. Now my classmates who went to Bahrain and other Arab countries cannot, cannot go back to Jerusalem. So you were lucky that you got the US passport. That's the only reason I can go back. I can only go back for three months. So imagine when I go to Ben Gurion airport, and a woman with a Russian accent asks me where I was born. <laughs> Is that ironic? It's ironic. And so, obviously, I tell her it's a question is not where I was born because you know where I was born. It's written in front of you. The question is, where were you born? Right. 
you know. So why don't we hear more about the Christian uh, community uh, from the Arab world? Because not only in Palestine and Gaza, we have Christians all over the Arab world. There are millions, tens of millions of Christians. I mean, in Egypt alone, 10% of the population, if not 20, is Christian. Right. So we're talking about 11 to 20 million people in Egypt alone. Right. Lebanon has a more or less 50-50 Christian Muslim. But because we don't, when we go on television, okay, we don't say I'm a Christian Palestinian. You know, we, are, we go as Palestinians. Mm. So for us, Allah comes first and Philistine comes second. Simple. Christian Muslim, it doesn't matter. And we have Jews that are Palestinian. Right. And we're very proud of them and very protective of them. The Naturei Karta, for example, in Jerusalem are Haredi Jews, Orthodox Jews, but they don't recognize Israel and they wear the Palestinian flag and, and they get kicked by the Israeli soldiers the same way Israelis kick our women and children in the guts. So how is the um, connection with the Western Christian Zionism? Because I've been reading some stuff about how uh, some of them are actually celebrating um, the massacre of Palestine, including the Christians, thinking that, you know, that's part of the bigger plan for the Messiah's second coming. So well, what's the relationship like? Are, honestly, they, can, they, can, they are, honestly, they are misguided individuals. Uh, they, they don't know their Bible. Yeah. You know, they do not know their Bible. The chosen people are not the Jews. The chosen people are those who followed Christ. You know? It's a broader theological concept. It is. Right. So, we as Christians, you know, consider ourselves as the chosen people by, by, uh, by the, through the Bible. Okay? So, our relation, we have very antagonistic relationship with the uh, the far-right Christian Zionists in the United States. They do not speak for Christianity. They have nothing to do with Christianity. From my perspective, they are not Christians. Understood. Um, so you, as I mentioned in the beginning, you were an advisor to late Yasser Arafat, and I'm sure you have lots of stories that are unpublished. Um, and talking about Jews and Muslims and Christians in Palestine, um, in a previous conversation, I remember you mentioning um, how after Osman Accords, um, Arafat wanted to make sure that the, uh, the parliament would have not only seats for Christians, but also for Jews. Could you unpack that a little? Yes. Uh, I mean, uh, during the Oslo Accords, um, I was in constant uh, uh, communication with President Arafat. Mm -hmm. Um, at the time, I was at Harvard University, and Harvard asked me to head a program of technical assistance to the Palestinian government. So in the span of 24 months, I took 18 missions wow. to Palestine. And we met every time at the beginning of the mission, and at the end of the mission with the president mm -hmm. to give him our report. We met at first to tell him what we would like to do and how we can be of help. And then we would provide him with the report. So in our conversations, you know, I asked him, Mr. President, why did you appoint a certain number of seats for Palestinian Christians? and a seat for uh, Jewish Palestinians. He said, listen to me, after I am gone, there might not be anyone to protect you. So I wanna make sure that you are protected as a community because you are part and parcel of Palestine. You are the salt of the earth. You are the salt of the earth. You are the salt of the earth. Okay. And so not only were the designated seats for Christians in the Palestinian parliament, there were also seven municipalities in Palestine 
including Bethlehem, where Jesus Christ was born, right. and Beit Sahor, which is a neighboring town, and Beit Jala, which is another neighboring town, which I call the Christian Triangle. All the mayors, by law, have to be Christian. Right now, the majority of population in Bethlehem is Muslim, not Christian. Mm -hmm. Yet, by law, the, the mayor has to be Christian. Now, of course, the city council has members of, from, uh, from all, uh, all sides, all political sides, not just the religious sides, all political sides, because we don't measure ourselves in terms of, of uh, Your religion. Right. We, we, uh, you know, we are either on the uh, popular front with Fatah, with the PFLP, with, and so on and so forth. So, it, it, you know, the most uh, probably articulate Christian Palestinian is Hanan Ashraoui. Nobody knows she's Christian, or very few people do. But she it's a national identity. That it's a national. She never says, "I am, I am a Christian." She never said that. Okay. You know. So maybe it, it's a good point now to start talking about the zist of the issue, which is Hamas. So um, after the October seventh attack, um, you wrote, and I quote: "The Palestinian Authority does not control anything except segments of the West Bank." Any future peace talks must include Hamas, whether one agrees with their Islamist ideology or not. You negotiate with whoever has the power. Now, I understand your real politic here, and that makes a lot of sense. And you are coming from the Wall Street. If anyone knows how to negotiate, obviously you'd be one of them. But help me understand this. Now, the whole argument of Israel right now is that Hamas does not accept Israel's rights to exist. Hamas does not accept the two-state solution. And now Hamas is, um, you know, being seen as the contemporary Nazis. Netanyahu called them Amalek. Well, I mean, he probably mentioned the whole Palestine, but particularly, uh, you know, Hamas. Um, and so Hamas does not accept the Israel's right to exist. Um, Israel does not see Hamas as an actor that they would um, sit on the same table with. So um, given the real politic, which makes sense, but how do, how do you think is that is, is that even possible? How do you go there? Uh, to begin with, you know, uh, and to be fair to Hamas, the Palestinian Authority, headed by Fatah, has been negotiating with Israel for years, decades. You know, Israel uh, Netanyahu has said many times when he was forced to that he supports the two-state solution. In reality, he doesn't. Right. He, he you know, said that actually. Oslo, Oslo stated that the negotiations would take four, five years, after which, and only four is five issues were remaining on the table, right. after which a Palestinian state would be established. It is not us who did not commit to what we agreed to, it is Israel. Mm -hmm. And in that regard, I can agree with Hamas in the sense that the, the Israeli government, represented by Netanyahu and his thugs and murderers, you know, should never be recognized even as human beings. The Israeli for, uh, defense minister called us human animals. Right. If we are human animals, what is he? What is he? That's exactly what I'm talking about. So, how does so that Hamas, Hamas is a political ideology that wants an Islamist state in Palestine. Now, I am a secular Palestinian, Christian or not. I want a state based on secular, on a constitution, not on the Quran, not on the Injil, not on the Bible, you know, on a constitution like Turkey is. And that was one of the rifts between Arafat, PLO, Fatah, and Hamas since the 80s, isn't it? Exactly. Uh, so, but then allow me to understand, if Hamas, given that they have the power now, hence they are the ones that we, 
that should be negotiated with, but they have this Islamist ideology. So what kind of future would then project for Palestine? Um, how does how does that really work? Well, I mean, you know, listen, we have to be realistic. Well, I mean, uh, whether we like it or not, Israel is there. You know, the British divided our land along with the French and invited the Jews to come to Palestine. They were running away from the pogroms. And, and they were the running away. It's an and, European problem. And we opened, it is a European problem, we opened our arms and welcomed them. Right. Until we figured out that their intention was to kick us out and establish a Jewish state. Then our people started fighting. You know, unfortunately, we did not have the expertise the, that, 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 that Jews had from Europe and other places. We did not have the technologies. We did not have the money, you know. So even a combination of Arab armies was defeated by Israel in a very short period of time in 1948 and again in 1967. This is the first time that, Ham, that Israel is fighting a war that has lasted four months. The first time. And Israel has not won the war. It, Israel can destroy all of Gaza, but it will never win the war. Why? Because Palestinians are on the ground. And that's why Egypt says no Palestinians are allowed to cross into Sinai. The Israelis would love for the, uh, for the Palestinians to cross into Sinai. That way they would have an empty land and they would uh, colonize it the way they colonize the rest of Palestine. It's important you mentioned that because a lot of the um, uh, critiques, let's say, um, in the Muslim world, particularly in the Turkish public, focus on um, you know the Arab leaders, um, the um, close by states, and then say, well, if you love them so much, why don't you accept them? And this is such a distorted way of looking at things, because as you just said, um, if, you, if, if, if the Palestinians leave, then they're basically leaving the land um, to the occupier. Uh, I mean, look at what happened to me. They they were happy to kick me out. And there are tens, at least I, I, there are records of 14,000 Palestinians from Jerusalem that were expelled by the Israelis, including myself. So, but going, I, I want to go back to the political point with regard to Hamas. Now, I may, I may not agree with Hamas ideologically, but Hamas, we have as a people, as a Palestinian people, we have the right to fight for our freedom. Nobody can deny us that right. Nobody on earth can deny us that right. It's an inherent right, inalienable right for us to fight for our freedom. And Hamas is fighting for our freedom. And for that, in that regard, I support it. I do not support what they did in, on October 7th. First. I do, I, and I, do, I certainly don't. Uh, I mean, I condemn with the strongest words what the Israelis are doing. They have shown their true face to the entire world. Their true face, their true intentions is to annihilate the Palestinian people. And we will not be an annihilated. Not by Israel, not by America, not by anyone. It seems to me like that Hamas um, has been winning the public perception war. No. Communications war. Uh, listen. Uh, cornered Israel. Um, actually, on TikTok, I was reading the other day, um, I think there's billions of um, Gen Z um, posting with the hashtag Free Palestine, and that's like 30 times more than Gen Z on TikTok. Um, using the hashtag free, free Israel. So it, it seems like Hamas was able to mobilize globally, uh, particularly the youth. So it's kind of like this, when it comes to public perception, it seems like Hamas has the upper hand. Well, I mean... It, Which it, is it, interesting because they're the first uh, Muslim organization that used suicide bombing, as you said. Uh, they are, um, you know, well known with their Islamist ideology. So the reality isn't always black and white, I suppose. Uh, no, it's not. It's not black and white. Hamas right now are Palestinians. They are fighting the Israelis. They're not Hamas. They're Palestinians fighting the Israel. The people that are getting killed are civilians mostly. 
I mean, Israel bombed the two churches in Gaza. Two churches. And I want to tell the Christian evangelists that Israel bombed the two churches. One of my relatives was killed in the church. 22 people were killed. And Israel can deny anything that they want to deny. The reality is on the ground. 22 people were killed. Her sister lost her leg. A week later, the brother had a heart attack, but could not find medical care, died. So what's happening? They're murdering us in front of the world. This is the first war in history that is being televised live. Very well documented indeed, despite all the censorship. And talking about censorship, you were the chief editor of Al-Fajar newspaper back in the 80s, at yes. Jerusalem based. And you were uh, subjected to censorship by then, <clears throat> but then obviously censorship has grown um, since then, along with growing technology. But still then, despite all the censorship, um, there's still a lot of coverage of it uh, through social media. Um, and so, and that's probably partly, um, we should acknowledge and appreciate the fact that this is the way it gets out to the world and then that's how, you know. Yeah, but in the 80s and 90s, there was no social media. Right. So even, I mean, our editorials were uh, censored, our articles were censored, even the obituaries. <laughs> when, when people die and say that they have died, if they say al shaheed it is censored. You know? Uh, you know, I, but the guy fought. Yeah, what he's he, in all of, you know, exactly. Problems. Yeah. Um, so, Bishara, you've written uh, two books on arms sales, and one of those books focused on Israel's sales to Latin America back in the 80s, and you are working on a similar project now on drones. Um, now, recently, you wrote a piece, um, and you mentioned that how in 2022, uh, Israel had um, a record in its arms sales. And then I quote, you continue, Israel's failure to defend itself could discourage, you're mentioning October 7th, could discourage future purchases. Israel's military tech represent the best of the best in best in military. Israel's defeat will have a lasting impact on the emerging multipolar world. China, Russia, and non-Western oriented countries will study and uncover the vulnerabilities of the Western military alliance. Can you further unpack that, please? Well, I mean, Israel, since the late 70s and early 80s, um, uh, started selling arms, and e and their biggest market was Latin America. Why? Because there were dictators all over Latin America. And when Jimmy Carter came as president of the United States, he said, I'm not going to sell arms to dictators, but he allowed Israel to sell arms to the dictators. Why? Because the arms had U.S. components, which required U.S. approval to sell them. You know, so uh, Israel, Israel has maintained its arms industry, has grown it considerably, is considered stronger than most European countries militarily. But the myth of Israel has been shattered by Hamas. You know, it, I, I am writing a book about drones. And drones, in my view, are going to change warfare in the 21st century. Right. And that's the theme of my book. Now, when Hamas attacked Israel on October 7th, the first thing they did was through their drones, they had kamikaze drones go and attack, drop bombs on the three major towers. Mm. alongside the Israel-Gaza border, thus, thus uh, uh, the, communication the communication was between, uh, border and then between the Israelis on the border and the Israeli military was, was gone, okay. was completely cut off. That's why Israeli response came later. And they claimed that Hamas killed 1,153 people. In reality, the Israelis killed many, uh, most, uh, maybe a third of those people. Mm. Because when the Israelis got wind of the fact that Hamas was there, 
the Israeli helicopter gunships were shooting at people, including Israelis. They were shooting their own people. Yeah, we've been um, hearing more about that on the uh, news and reading about that more recently. Um, actually, this is interesting. So one uh, one thing that we need to consider in terms of uh, the future of military warfare is the drones, um, absolutely. But then also um, another person, uh, Mike Doran of Hudson, uh, made a comparison between uh, Israel's Israel's military technology, uh, resembling it to Star Wars. So you know mm-hmm. that really high technology, and they compared to Hamas, and they called Hamas Mad Max style. Um, which basically means that this uh, trust and hype, this hyper trust in technology, uh, might have caused Israel to kind of like weaken itself on classical intelligence, traditional intelligence gathering, um, operation uh, capacities, and basically border control. So, in some ways, as we look into the future of military developments, maybe uh, such um, uh, blind reliance on technology is not such a good idea. Maybe. Well, I'm not going to give advice to the Israelis, okay? So, but they caught, but they were caught with their pants down on October 7th. Hamas was smarter than they were. The Israelis, uh, they used to advertise, or still do, their military equipment as battle-tested. Mm. Battle-tested on whom? On the Palestinian people. Battle tested on the Palestinian people, and the world cheers up and buys their their equipment. Even Muslim countries buy their equipment. Bishar, do you think that the ongoing war is gonna escalate into turn into a regional conflict? Now, I already we already know that you know the Red Sea, uh, the Yemenis, um, um, uh, Iran, Lebanon, all involved, and now more recently. Uh, with the violation of Philadelphia, well, they, um, Camp David and the control of Egypt on Philadelphia corridor. So now Egypt is angered. Um, and there, there's proxy wars going on. But do you think that this may escalate, as Foreign Minister of Saudi Arabia also stated, into an actual uh, regional war? I mean, the truth is, I would like to scare the world about the potential escalation. The Arab countries are not going to fight. Those who want to who want to fight up are already fighting. The Yemenis, the Iraqis, the Syrians, the Lebanese, and the Palestinians. Everybody else is happy on their thrones, throwing their own lavish parties, as though nothing is happening with with the murder of people. You know what? We don't need sadaqa. We don't need their money. We have our dignity to maintain. We will eat dirt than ask for their money. You know, it seems to me like nothing has changed historically because from Nasser to Sadat, I mean, not just Egypt, but Jordan, Syria, all of these countries at times use Palestine as a political bait since uh, the anti-colonial struggles, right? Mm-hmm. So it seems like that hasn't changed. Um, but the, it's interesting. So South Africa with the lawsuit um, they said, okay, well, we don't want any uh, Muslim or Arab countries to be involved in the case because we don't have time, and plus we have the political will, and we have an experience with the apartheid state, which kind of does make sense, all right? Uh, but going back to your former point, um, why, why do you think that's the case? I mean, um, take Saudi Arabia. They're doing a lot of reforms, right? They're trying to become a regional power, Heck, today, I just read that they opened up a new alcohol shop um, in a district that's mostly uh, resident by dem- uh, by diplomats. Uh, so all of these, um, you know, reformist moves are happening. Couldn't have, for example, step it, bu- step it up and then gain the hearts of the Arab people, the Arab street. You know, uh, there is a big difference between the Arab leaders and the Arab people. The Arab people are with us. The Muslim people are with us. The Europeans are with us. More of the Americans are with us. Latin America is with us. Israel is an only uh, wolf right now. You know, it's a tiger that has been unfeigned. And so, uh, Israel, uh, of course, the Arabs right now are offering uh, a recognition of Israel 
in return for a promise uh, to establish a Palestinian state. I do not, and I put it on record, I do not, nor do most Palestinians, the vast majority, believe in any Israeli promises, period. We don't. They are liars. They have proven to be liars. Whether it was the Labour Party, whether it was Barak, Barak, whether it was Elmort, who now talks about two-state solution. When you were prime minister, why didn't you implement the two-state solution? Why? Now that you're not prime minister, you talk about it? We don't need you. So you don't think there's any actor within the Israeli political landscape that would really support two states? No, there are Israelis who do support two state solution. There are. They are unfortunately in the minority. I mean, I write for the three Israeli newspapers, okay? Because I want them to hear my point of view. And uh, I understand from my friends that Haaretz, the Israeli leftist newspaper, was threatened to be shut down by Israel. I mean, it, 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 it's not, it's, it's, it's a dictatorship. Right now we have somebody like Ben Gvir, Ben Gvir who is a right wing murderer, a convicted felon, handing out machine guns to people. You know, what kind of a government is that? Why should the United States accept such a government? The United States people are with us. The U.S. elected officials are not because they are bought by money. And Ilhan Omar was right when she said it's all about the Benjamins. It is true. It's about the, med- the money. The Harvard University president was forced to resign because Bill Ackman, you know, a prominent bill- uh, uh, Jewish American billionaire, decided to go after her. The person who questioned the Harvard University president in Congress was a Harvard graduate, and shame on that person. You know, this is how, this is not how uh, uh, academia is run. This is not how exchange of thought is run. They cannot silence us. They want to silence us. But the U.S. Supreme Court just last week said that people, Palestinians and their supporters have the right to demonstrate, have the right to voice their opinion. They have the right to call for uh, a a boycott of Israel. They have that constitutional right. And governments cannot force us. Governments in, in every state are saying, if you don't, I mean, in Texas, if you don't sign a pro uh, saying that you're not going to be against the state of Israel, you will not be hired as a teacher. So a Palestinian American teacher said, no, they, I don't want to hire, I don't want the job. And, I took, I, and she went to court. You know, why? Why this it's injustice? It, it is unbelievable. No, in America, politicians are bought. They are bought, simple. I think the silver lining in all of this is that if there is one, I, I guess, um, Palestine issue has become such a surrogate mother uh, for the north and the south and, 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 and the east and the west. Yes. Um, I think people are standing up against um, the injustices that they're seeing. I mean, I think, you know, even going back to the Arab Spring, Black Lives Matter occupation, you know, all of those moments from Algeria to Africa. I think we had like 147 different youth protests in the last decade or so. Um, and in regards to Palestine, we had, um, I think, about 100 countries with, uh, with protests that are pro-Palestinian. There is, there is an Israeli think tank that actually uh, was uh, counting the pro-Israel demonstrations versus the pro-Palestine demonstrations. A week after the October 7th, m- most of the demonstrations were pro-Israeli. Right now, 95% are pro-Palestinian. And on social media, I just saw a, a, a statistic that said 83% of social media posts are pro-Palestinian. 83%. Mm-hmm. 
numbers are from around the world. Yeah, 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 globally. So you were just talking about the U.S. So let me jump into that um, because elections are coming up, mm-hmm. and um, I mean, you know, with the current president, because um, he Biden was able to um, get a lot of support from Arabs and Muslims and yes. U.S. particularly in swing states like Michigan, mm-hmm. um, and also the younger population, Gen Z. But now, as things unfold, uh, we see a very um, meaningful statistical decline, actually, that's measured at the polls, uh, both from Arabs, uh, Muslims, young people, but also even from mainstream uh, Democrats, so basically American Democrats. So how do you see this playing out for him? Um, And if he's defeated, then let's just say, you know, a scenario Trump wins. Uh, will there be any difference in foreign American foreign policy, in particular regarding um, Palestine? You know, I don't like to make predictions because intelligent pe- people become stupid when they make a prediction. Okay, mm. my prediction is Biden is going to lose, I, and that's a prediction I'm putting on publicly. Right, okay. Biden is going to lose. He does not have the support. He does. I mean, as crazy as Trump is, he has 74 million followings, people who are willing to go to the polls and elect. Biden does not have that support. Biden won Michigan because of Arab and Muslim votes. Biden won other states because of Arab and Muslim votes and our supporters, I mean, blacks, Latinos, uh, you know, uh, progressives, yeah, yeah. progressives, they are right now the mood among Arab Americans and Muslim Americans is to punish Biden. Mm. They want to punish him, even at the cost of getting Trump. They want to punish him for the massacres that he has allowed. Biden is complicit with the massacres that the Israelis are doing. From day one, he started shipping uh, them armaments, uh, uh, trucks, uh, artillery, and so on. As between <clears throat> October 7th and December 26th, 230 U.S. cargo planes flew to Israel with, with all kinds of ammunition, trucks, vehicles, uh, uh, you know, tanks and 20 ships, huge ships, loaded with arms, went to Israel. What, what are the Israelis uh, going to use those arms for? They're, they are using them to kill Palestinians. And Biden is saying, oh, we're going to ask Congress for $100 million for the, for the Palestinians. You know what? President Biden, take that money and shove it you know where. Oh. Okay, we've talked about the U.S., we've talked a little bit about Arab leaders. How about Turkey? What do you think Turkey's role should be? What can Turkey do? Can it do anything? What would you want to see Turkey doing? Well, Turkey is a very important regional uh, player. I mean, it's the second largest army within NATO. Right. So, uh, but at the same time, Turkey is being punished by the United States. The F-35s are not being sold to Turkey because of Turkey's position with regard to the Palestine-Israel conflict. That's not, that's not fair and it's stupid. Stupid why? Because if NATO has to go to war without Turkey, they, uh, they cannot go to war, okay? So t- Turkey is an integral part. Now, with regard to Israel, Turkey has to, I know it will come at an economic cost. They have recalled the ambassadors and so on. Turkey has to stop exporting anything to Israel. Let them go buy it. You know, a week after, uh, a week after October 7th, you know where the uh, uh, the uh, Israelis were getting their tomatoes from? Jordan. Trucks coming from Jordan. Shame on them. Shame not on the people of Jordan. Shame on the leadership. Why? Why give the Israelis tomatoes? Let them starve. 
our people right now are eating the the what the animals eat. They're grinding it, making it in the, into bread. The animal feed and, and eating it as bread. Is that how the Muslim world wants to see Palestine? But wouldn't that also punish Israeli citizens who may very well be anti-Zionist and anti-war and really support two-state solution? Because I, the way we, I mean, the reason why we um, criticize Israel is this disproportionate and what others have called genocidal response where it's killing civilians. Um, so it, it's, a, it's a conundrum. All I'm saying is maybe it's a bit of a difficult decision to make there. Not that Jordan was thinking about this. I don't know that. But um, how do we keep our morality? I understand. I mean, this is a massacre and it's, uh, it's inhumane. And um, every day, we're, it's like we wake up and we're like, can it get any worse? And it's like next day, yes, it can. So I absolutely understand that. But doesn't the same apply to Israeli citizens? You know, I mean, I don't want to deprive women and children from food. I don't. Jewish or not, I don't. They should have food. They should have shelter. They should have water. They should have fuel. But our people are having nothing. No water, no fuel, everything. I mean, Turkey sent a, a, a huge container boat of food to Gaza. It rotted. Yeah, it was not allowed in. Yeah. You know, because it was not allowed in. Now, I heard the Egyptian president yesterday yeah. say that the Rafah crossing, we control it and it's open. But the Israelis insist on inspecting anything that goes into Gaza uh, unless they uh, search it. Yeah. You know, what? I, if I were Egypt, I would say, I'm sending in the, the food, I'm sending in the supplies, I'm sending in the medicine, and bomb them. Go ahead and bomb them. Bomb them. All right. Um, Let's talk about um, the proportionality of all of this. Now, the October 7 attack, it, it was obviously an attack, and then um, people were taken hostages, Israeli citizens, and people were murdered. And obviously, Israel did have a right to retaliate. But the issue here is um, the, the intensity and the scope of that retaliation. This is um, not a proportionate retaliation. Again, um, um, people have called this um, including experts and lawyers and, you know, the cases at the ICJ anyway, a genocidal response. So, yeah, and it's not just the numbers, right? So because in modern states, we have seen before this ratio of one to 10. So one country uh, kills one person and the other retaliates with killing 10. It's not just that. I think it's the uh, people are really angry about this public outcry is about, you know, bombing of schools, churches, um, mosques, 131 mosques were bombed you know, in Gaza. That means there's probably no mosques which no, is left anymore. No, like everything is no mosques, no hospitals, nothing. Um, no hospitals, as you say. So I am wondering, so what would be, because nobody, it seems to me like talking about this. So what would have been an alternative response um, that Israel could have done? It's obvious that this is disproportionate. This is an acceptable inhumane. But what could have they done? Um, differently, and that would have been more effective. Actually, uh, two 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 points to your uh, to your question. One, everyone talks about 125 hostages. We have 7,000 prisoners, Palestinian prisoners, in Israeli jails. Did they walk into those jails? They didn't. Were they arrested by force? They were. Are they being tortured? They are. Are Israeli hostages in Gaza tortured? No. Are they being treated well? Yes. Will they return? Yes. They will be returned. You know? But at the same time, the, it, it, you know, the Israel could have avoided all of that if a two-state solution was established. So don't blame Hamas for October 7th. The, 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 the story begins 75 years ago. Let me jump in right here. Um, again, you worked with um, Arafat. Do you think he, was there anything he could have done differently 
to um, to establish a long-lasting peace, maybe in the late 90s. I mean, if you could do a memory lane, I suppose, anything would Yes. Mind. The mistake of Oslo was to trust the Israeli world. The negotiations and the recognition of Israel should have come in return for the recognition of a Palestinian state and the establishment of a Palestinian state. All the Palestinians got was a recognition that the PLO, the Palestine Liberation Organization, is the sole representative of the Palestinian people. Okay, not a big deal. All the, all the Palestinians got was a promise that uh, a, a Palestinian state would be established in five years after five key issues are being negotiated. Now, nothing happened. Nothing happened. But I mean, so, wait, uh, in, in hint, but because Arafat wanted peace. He really wanted peace. I mean, people call him a terrorist, whatever they want to call him, fine. Arafat wanted peace. Tzhak Rabin was murdered by the Israelis. Why? Because he wanted peace. Without, he was the one who signed the Oslo with, with Arafat, right? He was the one, he was the prime minister at the time. Mm. The one, the people that signed the agreements were it's, uh, Shami, uh, were um, Perez and Abbas, uh, not Arafat and, and Tzhak Rabin. And I was there at the White House when that happened. Mm -hmm. Now, Arafat wanted peace, but I think we should have agreed, we should have never agreed to the terms of the Oslo Accord, never. We will never agree to anything resembling Oslo, mm -hmm. never, ever. We want a Palestinian state today, if they want peace, that's the price of, a, that's the price of peace, a Palestinian state, and leave us alone. We don't want anything with you. We don't want an army. We, why would we want an army? We don't want to fight that. Give us a Palestinian state. We don't want an army. Interesting. Well, I think we're coming to um, the last minutes of our broadcast. So um, before uh, we let you go, do you see any light at the end of the tunnel this time? Uh, Bibi has recently, Netanyahu has recently um, said that he opposes a Palestinian state uh, post-war. So that's a very um, radical statement, obviously. So well, what do you think? Should we have... Um, as long as Netanyahu and his thugs, the right-wingers, are in power, there is no hope. Zero. Zero. Okay? Once, if Netanyahu goes, and there is a centrist, reasonable Israeli government, perhaps there will be hope. But they have to accept the principle of a Palestinian state. There is, right now, in historic Palestine, there are 14 million people. 14.1, to be precise. 7.1 are Palestinians, and 7 million are Jews. Israel wants a Jewish state. So that's a 50-50, that's a very... Um, it, it, yeah, the, Israel wants a Jewish state. They can never have a Jewish state with the Palestinians on the ground. Never. That's why we don't want the Gazans to leave Gaza. We don't want to Gaza. I will go and volunteer instead of somebody else in Gaza to be there under the, under the bombs. I will volunteer. But we will not leave Gaza. And we don't want anyone to leave the West Bank or East Jerusalem. No one should leave. People call me, say, we don't have a job. Can you help us uh, go somewhere else? I said, no, I can help you. Maybe I can send you money. Maybe I can uh, help you find a job, but I will never help you leave Palestine, never. Because our presence in Palestine is the key element that forces the Israelis to think about creating a Palestinian state. Our presence on the ground Unless we are there on the ground, Israel will erase the whole notion of Palestine and they will have 
an Israel from the river to the sea. Shara, thank you so much for all of your insights. But sadly, we came to the end of our program. Um, again, welcome to Turkey. Thank you very much. I'm happy to be in Turkey. My wife is Turkish, so I'm honored to be here. <laughs> you are. And it's been 10 years since I last saw you. I wish it was under different circumstances, but, you know. Inshallah, it's... next time things will be different. Inshallah. Um, thank you so much for watching us. Maybe we'll see you at another deep dive. Good night.